have the uh, extreme pleasure of having Michael Turner here, who's going to give us these lectures for this week. Uh, Michael is a theoretical astrophysicist and I guess well known to uh, certainly the more senior people in this audience who certainly have enjoyed talks of him uh, over the years. Uh, as a few things to say, I should say he's, for example, guilty for the words WIMP, which we are using the whole time, and dark energy, as he coined them, and they stuck, so they were good, good contributions. But he has also the scientific contributions on dark matter and, and so forth, which he has uh, been discussing and which we, he will be presenting in his uh, talk here. Uh, he has held many positions. He's currently the University of Chicago and the Kavli Institute for Cosmology in Chicago, but also, for example, uh, director of the Physics Institute in Aspen. And uh, many of our American friends probably know from him as the uh, assistant director for physical science or the NSF, particularly if they were struggling with budget requests. Um, so Michael is a true expert in the field, and I think uh, we are very lucky to have uh, Michael to tell us today in his four lectures on the uh, dark energy, the dark side of the universe. Thanks, Mike. Thank you very much. So it's a pleasure to be here at this very exciting time. Um, and uh, I've organized the four lectures. T today's lecture is really uh, uh, to ease you in and an overview uh, of cosmology and a bit of history. And uh, of course, uh, this slide I probably don't need to tell people about, but uh, the reason that you would even have a cosmologist here, after some of my introductory slides, you'll wonder why you would have a cosmologist here, uh, is this convergence of the frontiers of uh, particle physics and cosmology, uh, where the questions that the two fields are answering uh, have converged and merged, dark matter, uh, neutrinos and the universe, uh, dark energy, uh, I won't be talking about the highest energy particles, but the kind of particles that uh, the OJ detector detects. How did the chemical elements originate? Uh, the reconciliation of quantum mechanics and gravity. Uh, black holes. Uh, what are space time and where did they come from? And uh, uh, different ways to say this, but what happened before the Big Bang? What caused the Big Bang to go off? And so um, these are the questions, and the two fields, uh, their frontiers are overlapping. And so uh, it now requires both telescopes and accelerators uh, to make progress. And of course, uh, you have a very nice accelerator here. Um, and I would just point out some of the new physics uh, that's come from cosmology. So first of all, the dark matter. And uh, I won't focus so much on the dark matter today. That will be the next lecture. Uh, but it's a new form of matter. That's the leading hypothesis. Um, but make, being, it, being called the leading hypothesis doesn't make it true. So we have to make that true. And of course, the LHC uh, could well uh, help to resolve that problem. Uh, dark energy. Um, what did I call it here? Mysterious new form of energy. So this uh, is not, was not on anybody's parks, parts list. If you wanted to take the most radical view of dark energy, you could say that it's sort of a, uh, a slap in the face to the whole reductionist approach. Uh, the one thing that we think we know about dark energy is that it's not particulate. You can't break it up into smaller pieces. It's more like a medium. Maybe it's as something as mundane as the quantum energy of the vacuum, or it could be something more, much more interesting. So that will be the third lecture. Um, and then uh, scalar fields. Uh, I hear that the LHC is searching for scalar fields or supersymmetry. And uh, we have a whole story uh, involving cosmology based upon inflation. And inflation, I'll talk about in the fourth lecture, is predicated upon, this, uh, upon a scalar field or possibly more uh, exotic physics. And then last but not least in the new physics, uh, uh, that comes from cosmology is, is uh, baryogenesis or leptogenesis, um, where the baryon number of the universe came from. And actually, I won't talk about that because uh, Hitoshi Murayama, I think uh, a month from now, uh, will be talking about that. Okay. Um, cosmology is a young science. Um, it's even younger than particle physics. 
And the story of cosmology uh, only began about 90 years ago, more than 300 years after the uh, invention of the telescope. And so since it's such a young science, uh, in just a few minutes I can go through almost all of the history. Um, so first of all, it, it, it begins with uh, Einstein and general relativity. Um, Newton's theory was not a powerful enough mathematical framework to describe the universe. And so you could not make any theoretical progress uh, until you had uh, general relativity. And of course, it was Einstein who brought us lambda. And uh, I was just reading uh, about the election that brought us Obama. And they were reminding us about uh, the previous election and John Kerry, who got annihilated because he was a flip-flopper. On uh, first he did this, and then he first he voted against it before he voted for it. And but Einstein was a flip-flopper on lambda, but he still got a Nobel Prize and still was the man of the century. So um, uh, the first uh, data in the field, or, or the birth of the observational side of cosmology, uh, was in the 1920s uh, with Edwin Hubble. And Hubble really did uh, three things. Uh, most everybody knows that he discovered the expansion of the universe, but I will just pause to say the thing that he did before that that may have been even more important. Uh, in 1925, he published a paper resolving the puzzle of the nebulae. So uh, there were these fuzzy patches on the sky that had been studied for 200 years. Uh, there was raging debate in astronomy about whether those were gas clouds within our own galaxy or... Uh, as Immanuel Kant called them, island universes. And Hubble resolved stars in the nearest nebula, the Andromeda galaxy, got a distance, showed that it was an external galaxy, and enlarged the universe by a factor of a billion, actually by 100 billion. There are 100 billion galaxies. Uh, so that, that's a pretty big achievement. Um, he was also famous for being able to take a scatter plot and draw a straight line through it. Uh, Particle physicists know that well. So uh, here is the original Hubble diagram. And back in those days, astronomers measured velocity in kilometers. Uh, actually, that was a typo. These are kilometers per second. And uh, distances in parsecs. A parsec is about three uh, light years. And uh, this goes out to about two million parsecs. And uh, the, the data are, are pretty ratty. But he saw a straight line. Uh, in his defense, in his defense, uh, astronomers had been measuring velocities of things for a very, very long time. Well, not for a long time, 10, 20, 30 years. And most of the velocities they got were down here in 10s and 20s and 30s of kilometers per second. So the idea that you would find objects moving at 1,000 kilometers per second was a really big deal. And that there was a correlation uh, and it's better than, you know, that's not just a scatter plot. There really is a correlation. Uh, this was a big deal, and this was the evidence for the expansion of the universe. Uh, this infamous Hubble constant that we'll come back to, he got the value 500 kilometers per second for megaparsec. And many, many people in uh, uh, other fields like to dump on astronomers saying, uh, you know, the errors are in the exponents, and how come he didn't put an error bar on it? And uh, I used to be a member of the group that would dump on astronomers for doing that. And I now realize that uh, actually he did something really smart. When you have no idea of the errors, putting an error, bar, bear, putting an error flag on it would be irresponsible. You would then be saying, I think I know what the, what the errors are. Now, whether or not those were Hubble's intentions, I have no idea. But I think it's a pretty good, uh, if I were his, uh, you might want to hire me as your defense attorney if you're accused of something. Um, so this is the expansion of the universe, uh, 1929. Uh, over, over Hubble's career, which ended with his death in the early 1950s, just to give you a sense uh, of uh, how, uh, how cosmology was data-starved, he and his assistant, Thomason, uh measured the redshifts of a few hundred galaxies. And the redshifts that they measured went all the way out to about one-tenth or 10% of the speed of light. So they probed a tiny little bit of the universe. And this comes back to explain why cosmology is a young science. The universe is really, really big and often beyond the reach of our instruments and our ideas. And uh, 
1948, the hot Big Bang model that uh, is universally uh, accepted uh, started with uh, a joke, uh, Gamow uh, writing a paper where he added as a third author Hans Bethe so that the authors would be Alpha, Beta, Gamma. Uh, in 1948, about 60 years ago, came up with a very radical idea that the, the beginning of the universe was very, very hot and that the universe was a nuclear reactor and it created the periodic table. Um, and this is an example of, of something I believe is very, very true in science, that often a wrong paper can be more important than a trivial right paper. So uh, the, his idea that you made the entire periodic table uh, was absolutely wrong. You only make the lightest elements. Uh, but this launched the hot big uh, bang cosmology. The idea in the beginning, it was hot. And so it was very important. The competing theory uh, was the steady state theory uh, put forward by uh, uh, Fred Hoyle, Herman Bondi, and uh, Tommy Gold. And uh, this was an incredibly, the, the history of this theory, I don't have time to talk about it, but part of, part of the reason it got put forward was he, Fred, who was the ultimate iconoclast, was upset because this theory, the Big Bang Theory, was in, endorsed by the Pope. Because it seemed, you know, it was the best scientific theory, uh, you know, the Pope could ever help for, hope for that would be consistent with the Bible. And so I think that was in part what motivated Fred. Um, this is an example of a beautiful theory murdered by ugly experimental facts. And uh, I, since it's not correct, I don't have time to go into it, but the steady state theory is sort of the most beautiful theory that you can ever have. It says the universe is timeless. It's always the same. You pay a tiny little price of the constant creation of uh, atoms, about one hydrogen atom per cubic meter per billion years or something like that. Unfortunately, an unevolving universe is so easy to falsify. You just need to find evolution anywhere that uh, it was falsified in about five years. Um, but uh, the best outcome of this theory was a paper written by uh, Margaret Burbage, Jeff Burbage, Willie Fowler, and Fred Hoyle that described how most of the periodic table is made in stars. And the reason that they wrote this paper is that since uh, Gamow was claiming he could make all the chemical elements to have this theory be competitive, they had to have a means of making the chemical elements. And this, pa <clears throat> this paper, this theory, uh, B squared FH, is generally uh, the accepted uh, means of, of how the chemical elements were made. Um, in, in 1970, uh, the 200-inch uh, at Palomar was just coming into play. This is a beautiful line drawing of that 200-inch telescope uh, uh, called the Perfect Machine or, or a Dinosaur Telescope. Uh, the mirror is here. The, the biggest pieces of the telescope are support elements. The mirror sits here and the prime focus cage and and uh, uh, Sandage was uh, Hubble's student, and uh, he coined the phrase that cosmology was the search for two numbers, and that this telescope, uh, he wrote a paper in the Astrophysical Journal describing how this telescope was going to find those two numbers. Now, I bet everyone here knows one of those numbers, the Hubble constant. Can anybody remind me what his other number was? Q naught. We'll come back to Q naught, the deceleration parameter. He felt that cosmology was just that. Um, at about the same time, uh, Landau uh, opined on cosmologists and pointed out that they're often in error but never in doubt, uh, which makes them really interesting colleagues. Um, at the University of Massachusetts, there was a faculty uh, handbook and it described what kind of courses you wouldn't find in a curriculum of higher education, and two of the courses it cited was a course on witchcraft or a course on cosmology. So cosmology was, was not, uh, was, was not uh, respectable science. Um, I think things char started to change in 1964 with the discovery of the cosmic microwave background uh, by uh, Bob Wilson and Arno Penzias using this at the time uh, very large uh, radio uh, antenna. 
where they discovered this excess noise at about, uh, well, they called it 3,000 megahertz, or mega, actually megacycles, uh, three, three gigahertz, and uh, wrote, actually, I should put a piece of the paper up here. It's a classic, pure experimental paper. It says nothing about the Big Bang. It reports on excess radio noise at, I forget what it was, 3,000 uh, megacycles, and says how they determined uh, that it was excess noise, independent of time of day, independent of, of the direction, can't be explained by the atmosphere, blah, 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 and that if you want to interpret it as radio astronomers often do, they interpret their signals as a black body temperature. The temperature was about three degrees. And so that was the discovery of the, uh, the uh, heat of the Big Bang. This was a confirmation of uh, Gamow's theory. Oops, let's skip that slide. Ah, Oh, let's see, I really screwed up here. This is not the slide I wanted here. Um, okay, we're going to have to make do with, with this tiny little slide. I apologize. We'll correct this in the slides that go on the web. Um, uh, so that changed... Uh, uh, oh, this is unfortunate, but I don't think I will try to uh, correct this real time. So that changed the way we thought about the universe. That meant that Sandage's universe... Uh, way of thinking about the universe was, was essentially dead uh, because if the universe was hot in the beginning, uh, then that changes the whole thing. It's not stars and galaxies. It's uh, uh, the most fundamental forms of matter. So it's quark soup. And as the universe expands, it cools and layer upon layer of structure gets built up. And when the universe is uh, order seconds old, that's the time it's a nuclear reactor and lithium and uh, a lot of helium and a little deuterium are made. We'll come back to that. Uh, then when it's a few hundred thousand years old, that's the time when atoms are formed. And then after the atoms are formed, the universe becomes transparent to light, which is uh, uh, the next slide. We'll go to the next slide here in a second. Um, and so it changes our understanding of the universe. Um, and here's a blow up of the last little bit. I apologize, this slide is out of order. Uh, we can come back to it if we need it. Um, so this is looking out in space, uh, and as you do, you look back in time. And here, not shown in this dark area here, is the whole history of the universe uh, from about 400,000 uh, years and earlier when the universe was ionized and opaque to light. And once it became neutral, uh, the uh, photons no longer scattered. And this shows that uh, these microwave photons, their surface of last scattering is the universe at this time, which for some odd reason is called recombination, um, when the universe became neutral. And so the microwave background allows us to look at this, at this time uh, before the formation of stars and uh, galaxies, which comes uh, much later. Um, and in 1972, uh, Weinberg wrote this now famous book called Gravitation and Cosmology, and he coined the term standard model, not to refer to particle physics, but to refer to the hot Big Bang model. And uh, th this model started with Big Bang nucleosynthesis, uh, the uh, microwave background, structure formed in the universe by uh, gravitational instability, uh, uh, at that time, we had a universe made of baryons only, and baryons contributed about 10% of critical density. Uh, the big questions were these cosmic parameters, though Weinberg's list was longer. Uh, H0 was still there, the age of the universe, the uh, fraction of uh, critical density. Uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, another big problem was why was there so much heat in the universe? The entropy per baryon... Um, in the microwave background is 10 to the 9. 10 to the 9 photons per baryon. If you look at the highest entropy places in the universe today, at the center of a supernova, it's 2 or 3 photons per baryon. This is enormous entropy. Um, and I won't talk about this anymore, so I'll dwell on it here. Um, it turns out we were looking at the wrong ratio, that instead you should be looking at baryon number per entropy, and so the issue is we have a tiny baryon number, a tiny net baryon number, and that's what Hitoshi's going to talk about. Um, the Hadron Wall, I'll go to that next. And uh, while we could understand where structure came from, 
by the gravitational amplification of small density and homogeneities, where did they come from? So those were the big questions. Um, let me just mention the Hadron Wall because this, at some level, is the birth of the collaboration between particle physics and cosmology. So um, here is a uh, different version of the history of the universe where time flows down. And here you can see the free neutrons and protons, Big Bang nucleosynthesis, the formation of atoms, and then uh, light coming to us today. And in, in Weinberg's book, in chapter 11, um, he talks about, um, I can't remember if he actually used the word hadron wall, but he talked about this wall at about 10 to the minus 5 seconds because if you have a universe where the elementary particles are hadrons and their friends, when you extrapolate back to 10 to the minus 5 seconds, the hadrons are on top of one another uh, because they have finite size. Moreover, they're strongly interacting. Moreover, at the time, the spectrum of hadrons was rising exponentially with mass, and so even if you neglected the fact that they were on top of one another, you have an exponentially rising uh, state of excitations and the idea of a temperature, uh, it's a mess. And so there was a wall here, I guess I call it the Hadron Wall, where you couldn't think sensibly earlier about the universe to all these interesting things that I'll be talking about. And of course that came down uh, with the discovery uh, that the fundamental bits are not hadrons but point-like uh, quarks and leptons, and that opened up this earliest 10 to the minus 5 seconds to all kinds of interesting speculations, uh, inflation, the birth of dark matter, the baryon asymmetry, uh, the, even the birth of the universe itself. And uh, there was a workshop in Santa Barbara in 1981 that brought together cosmologists and particle physics, and this is a t-shirt now available on eBay, collector's item, uh, Cosmology takes guts, and of course, uh, for the younger members of the audience, that was grand unified theories. Uh, uh, and then the 1980s, the go-go junk bond days of uh, early universe cosmology, um, this was the create, creativity-based, idea-based. Uh, this is where inflation, cosmic strings, baryogenesis, monopoles, phase transitions, uh, dark matter, all kinds of uh, ideas were born, uh, but ideas without uh, data. And the beginning of the data, the beginning of this field where you actually had data, and uh, so the story, I mean, the reason uh, uh, cosmologists always used to be in demand for giving colloquia, in fact, many institutions would invite me once a week to give a colloquium, because every week I'd come and give a different story, and it was, it was really, really interesting. And now uh, we give the same story every week because we actually have data and uh, the key elements of the story aren't changing. Uh, the data that started coming, I date this to maybe 1992 with, with COBE, and I'll show you some of the results of COBE. Uh, the, the redshift surveys where we were measuring the three-dimensional distributions of galaxies and defining the large-scale structure in the universe. Um, big telescopes with modern digital cameras and all kinds of other eyes on the universe. This is uh, the first redshift survey that was done, uh, the so-called CFA2 uh, redshift survey. Here we are. Galaxies are put at their distances by their velocity, so you use Hubble's law, and the ones that are moving faster are farther away. And uh, this is the structure that exists uh, uh, in the universe. And let's see. Uh, this redshift survey goes out to about uh, a redshift of 0.1 uh, would be here. And so you can see that there are very big structures, big empty voids. Uh, I think eventually this was called the Great Wall. Uh, stick Man, uh, just, well, uh, and those were the first uh, inklings of the large-scale structure in the universe, suggesting maybe that the universe was not isotropic and homogeneous. Um, the COBE satellite was uh, very important. It did two things. Uh, first of all, it brought us into the era of precision science. So here is the spectrum of the microwave background measured by the COBE satellite. Um, and uh, the data are shown by the error bars. And the green curve is a 2.725 Kelvin black body. And uh, I'm told there are a lot of experimentalists in the audience. And probably you can all see a problem with this plot is that the curve goes through all the data. 
So uh, this was done on the same set as uh, the moon landing. Uh, but actually, the data were so good that what I've shown you is an error bar multiplied by 500. And this is an incredible uh, uh, experiment. So the t let me just dwell here on the temperature. Uh, the, the temperature was measured to be 2.725 uh, plus or minus uh, 0.0001 plus or minus 0 0.001. And so uh, this was the temperature relative to a calibrating black body on board. Unfortunately, the thermometers that were measuring the temperature of that black body uh, only, had a only had a precision of 0 0.001. Um, and so the distortions from a black body are, at the, are, are less than the 0.005%. That reflects this top number. And the absolute temperature measurement um, is only four significant, only four significant figures. Uh, so this is a very impressive measurement. Uh, this is what the black body uh, radiation looks like on the sky in different directions. So it's very, very uniform. And if you turn up the color scale, the first thing you see is the giant dipole in the sky. It's hot in one direction and cool in another direction by about three millikelvin. And that's due to the fact that we're moving uh, with respect to the cosmic rest frame at about 620 kilometers per second. And then if you take that out, there are residual fluctuations at the level of tens of microkelvin. And these um, uh, are shown in this map. Kobe had a, uh, an angular... Uh, uh, resolution of about seven degrees on the sky, which defines the characteristic size of these uh, spots. Um, oh, and this is not the belt of the universe. This is uh, microwave emission from our own galaxy, so that's a foreground. And these are the fluctuations that, made, that got Kobe the Nobel Prize a few years ago in 2006. These are the fluctuations that... Uh, reflect the underlying uh, density in homogeneities that seeded all structure in the universe. And so these fluctuations are at the level of about 10 to the minus 5, uh, 0.001%. Uh, percent. Oh, this is just a fun slide that I'll quickly go through. Kobe also finally proved that Copernicus was right. So uh, Kobe also discovered a yearly modulation in the temperature of the microwave background uh, because they had forgot to correct for the motion of Earth through uh, around the sun, because that was still an unproven theory. And they, uh, of course, I'm just kidding. Uh, this is a slide that I wish they would publish, because I think it's absolutely fantastic. Here it is, uh, 365 days. The, the size of the effect is about 0.3 millikelvin. Uh, but there is the proof that the Earth uh, orbits uh, the sun. Now, I think people will appreciate this. The reason that WMAP hasn't published this is that WMAP actually calibrates its temperature scale off of this. So the most accurate determination of the temperature scale is COBE. So how do you calibrate off of COBE if you don't measure the spectrum? Well, since we know this velocity so well, you can, you can calibrate off the, the delta T of uh, the velocity. Um, other instruments, so uh, part of this data-driven revolution came from all kinds of, of uh, other uh, instruments. Uh, what we in the United States refer to as uh, conspicuous consumptions. Four 8.2 meter telescopes on one mountain. Uh, the only words that come to mind when you think about uh, the uh, ESOs, VLT, is uh, George Bernard Shaw, who when he visited uh, uh, Hearst's, uh, Hearst Castle in California said, this is the way God would have done it if he had the money. <laughs> and uh, so then there's the two Keck telescopes. Anyway, lots of telescopes, uh, big glass on the ground, uh, great observatories in the sky. The, we'll see some images from the Chandra X-ray Observatory, uh, the Hubble, of course. This is uh, the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, and this is the Spitzer Infrared Telescope. And just as important um, are these electronic cameras. When the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, uh, and I'll show you some of their maps of large-scale structure, um, uh, mapped the universe. Actually, I think I thought this was too... 
I guess it was a 100 megapixel camera. So mosaic chips, 20 some, I think it's 20 chips, uh, 100 megapixels uh, on the sky. And what's so important is photographic plates collect 1% of the light. Um, these CCDs collect almost 100%. Uh, the new cameras are now up to uh, billions of pixels. Um, and of course, here's the uh, iconic uh, image of our field, the Hubble Deep Field, um, which is, uh, this will be the only time I show it, so I have to wax poetic about it. Um, this uh, is an amazing photograph. Let me orient you. This is one ten millionth of the sky. In this one ten millionth of the sky, I have to look very carefully. Sorry, you will see two stars. One is easy to find. The other one's a little harder to find. So that's how small a piece of the sky it is. You only see two stars. The rest are galaxies. And if you count them, you'll find uh, uh, close to 3,000 galaxies. And then if you multiply, you know, 3,000 times, do the math, that's the 100 billion. Um, this is as far as you can see, because if you make more powerful instruments, you really can't see any farther, because you're looking so far back that you're looking to the birth of galaxies. So that's uh, the... And then this is the Chandra Deep Field, which is just as stunning. This is the Chandra uh, uh, X-ray Telescope. And so it's got a bunch of dots on the sky. And you might ask, what are those dots on the sky? And in the Chandra Deep Field, I think it's roughly the same size, maybe a little bit larger. Uh, what you're seeing are supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies. So every one of the images here, uh, I shouldn't say every one, most of the images here are supermassive black holes uh, accreting matter and giving off X-rays, most of them with very high redshifts. So uh, the, the 2000s, which we're just finishing, I guess we just finished, uh, this is now the era of precision-based cosmology. And no, uh, no cosmologist worth his salt travels without a Fisher matrix. And so uh, the idea is to take this enormous uh, data and extract uh, uh, information from it. OK, so I, this is what I've been showing in pictures. Um, Universe is very big, often beyond the reach of our instruments and our ideas, but we're in this period of revolutionary discovery driven both by ideas and, uh, and by uh, the instruments. And the two really important ideas, and, um, and, and I'll focus on both of them, uh, that came from this uh, theoretical work connecting particle physics and cosmology, uh, which changed the way we think about cosmology, is inflation. Um, and that'll be in the fourth lecture, I'll talk about that. A brief period of rapid expansion uh, in the early universe, maybe driven by a scalar field, which explains the heat of the Big Bang, that is the microwave background, why the universe is flat, why it's so smooth. You saw that I should have mentioned that first Kobe map. The universe is, was very smooth. It didn't, had no right to be that smooth. And it explains where the underlying inhomogeneities that Kobe detected that seeded large-scale structure came from. And the second really important idea is uh, that the bulk of the dark matter, which we'll talk about next time, which had been known for uh, back to the 1930s, uh, is not made out of atoms, but is in a sea of elementary particles left over uh, from the Big Bang. And uh, let's see if I... Uh, and if you put these two ideas together, which I see that I've left out a slide, the seed inhomogeneities from inflation and the idea that the dark matter is particles that interact weakly, left over from the Big Bang, you get the so-called cold dark matter theory of how structure formed, a theory that is so uh, detailed that it can be falsified, and eight times during its life, the cold dark matter theory has been falsified. And each time it turned out the data was wrong. So it's got one more life uh, left. OK. Uh, the consensus cosmology, uh, dark matter, uh, dark energy, uh, inflation uh, inspired. So that's where the density perturbations come from. And then it fits this large body of data. So let me show you some of the data. Um, the Hubble constant. So uh, uh, Wendy Friedman 
led the team that used about 30% of the Hubble time over the first, I forget, five or 10 years, the Hubble Key Project, to get the distance scale in shape. It's easy to measure these velocities. It's hard to measure the distances. And so this is um, their Hubble diagram. So it's a linear scale. Um, just to orient you, all of Hubble's data would have fit right here in that first box. Uh, this really does look like a straight line. And this measurement really does have error bars on them. And it has error bars of both types. So the statistical error um, is actually, that is, I can't remember if that's one or two. But right now, it's dominated by systematic error in the distance scale. And so the Hubble constant is right around uh, 70. Um, and this goes out to velocities about 10% the speed of light. Um, and this really does, this doesn't really look like a scatter plot. This really looks like uh, there's a linear relationship. Um, and then here's the scatter in the air is about uh, a Hubble constant of uh, 72. Um, and this will be the topic of the third lecture. But uh, this uh, quantity, the second number uh, that Sandage so carefully defined with a minus sign, the deceleration of the universe. So uh, he thought this was how fast is the universe expanding? Uh, at what rate is it slowing down? And he put in a minus sign because we knew it's slowing down and not accelerating. It turns out that uh, he shouldn't have put that minus sign in, that uh, A naught, the universe is accelerating, it's, it's not decelerating. And this uh, interesting story was the scientific discovery uh, or the scientific breakthrough of the year declared by uh, uh, Science Magazine uh, in 1998. Um, it shows how heavy the lifting is in the physical sciences. This is what it takes to kick the biologists off of the cover of Science Magazine. And then the, the microwave background, um, uh, of course there were measurements before COBE, but COBE uh, started this, COBE discovered the anisotropy, which has so much information uh, encoded in it. And uh, a series of experiments uh, followed Kobe uh, on the ground, and then I'll come to WMAP. A uh, very important experiment was the one that was led by Andrew Lang called Boomerang. It was an instrument. Uh, Andrew said it proves there's a god. Uh, it was an instrument that did two laps around the South Pole. So it was launched from McMurdo. And right around Christmas, uh, the winds are, there's a vortex that in principle takes a balloon on a smooth route. Uh, multiple times around. And in fact, Boomerang, after 10 days, came back to where it was launched. They saw it. There they are in McMurdo. And it's floating in front of them. They cut it down. They get in, uh, I forget what kind of a, well, nobody here knows. They got in a Jeep, drove out, and got it. Um, uh, other balloon experiments. This is an experiment uh, on the Atacama Desert. Uh, I point it out to you because it involves a reformed high-energy physicist. Uh, named Bruce Winstein. Some of you may have heard of Bruce. And uh, he's now measuring the microwave background, uh, an experiment called Akbar. Uh, and I'll show you some of the data from Akbar. And uh, the DAISY experiment of my colleague, John Karlstrom. And of course, the experiment that everyone has heard of is WMAP. Uh, it was an experiment designed by uh, David Wilkinson, uh, one of the pioneers of the microwave background. Uh, what was interesting is Penzias and Wilson discovered the microwave background accidentally. Uh, David Wilkinson and Bob Dickey were launching an experiment at precisely the same time looking for it, and they got beat by a couple of weeks. Um, but he continued to study the microwave background. Um, and there's the, this is our best map from WMAP. Uh, soon we'll have better maps from, than this from Planck. Uh, the fluctuations are at the, about the 0.001% uh, percent level. Uh, this is a map made by combining the five different frequency maps that they have to remove the foreground. Um, and uh, so this is how you can tell if you're destined for a career in cosmology. If you stare at that map, which is basically Gaussian random noise, and your heart goes pitter-patter, then you're a cosmologist. Um, the one feature that you can see in this map is if you look, 
there seems to be a fundamental size to the fluctuations, uh, about yay big, about one degree if you actually measure it. You can actually see that um, with your eyes. If you take the power spectrum, the multiple power spectrum, this is the, the map from seven years of, of, of WMAP. Um, the multiple power spectrum peaks at uh, an L of 200, which corresponds to about one degree. So this peak you can actually see you know, with your eyes. These other peaks only a theorist can see with their eyes because uh, we have specially designed eyes that take uh, uh, transforms. Um, and so these are acoustic peaks predicted by inflation. This curve is the consensus cosmology uh, which uh, passes uh, through all of these points. Uh, WMAP really only makes it out to an L of about 900, um, and then its beam, which is about two-tenths of a degree, is not big enough to resolve the detail. Planck will go out to about 2,500. Um, Ground-based experiments fill in out to about 3,000 right now. So this is the same curve, and these measurements are made by uh, Akbar and other experiments. And you can see that uh, this is pretty impressive. On the cosmology side, um, this, this, our standard model has about 11 parameters. I'll come to that in a minute. And uh, cosmologists used to say, or astronomers used to say, oh, if you can't fit all the data they get on the microwave background, with 11 parameters, uh, of course you can fit anything. Um, of course that's not true because there's several thousand independent points and if you only have 11 parameters, uh, the biggest fear that the theoretical cosmologists had that was that no set of parameters uh, would, would fit the data. Um, I want to pause here to briefly talk about uh, the microwave background. So uh, the underlying density perturbations uh, kind of look like this. I'll talk about this on Friday. So their amplitude is about 10 to the minus 5. As you vary from uh, small-scale galaxies to clusters to the largest scales, they vary smoothly. And I'll talk more about that on... Uh, so there's no particular, uh, you know, no, no particular shape. So you might ask, where did all this funny business come into play? And uh, how come, you know, the microwave background, when we plot it versus ang the angular scales that correspond to these scales, why does it look like that instead of this? Well, um, the, uh, the relationship between the underlying density perturbations which are being probed and the response of the microwave background is non-trivial and complex, but based upon simple physics. And so, um, actually, to an audience of experimentalists, you all understand this. This is actually a feature, not a bug, because that means that you can learn uh, uh, by the response of the microwave background to this, you can learn about all kinds of parameters. So um, the microwave background, what's going on is the baryons are trying to fall into the dark matter potential wells. The photon pressures before they decouple pushes them out, and they undergo what are called acoustic oscillations. And so what you're actually, these are the acoustic oscillations caught at an instant of time, different oscillations caught at different points in the cycle. And the response of the microwave background depends upon the matter density, the baryon density, the slope of this uh, initial spectrum, and so on and so forth. So that not only do you learn about this initial spectrum, you learn about a whole bunch of uh, parameters. And this just shows how you learn about the parameters. So for example, the matter density, um, as you uh, lower the matter density, the height of that first peak goes up. And uh, the curvature of the universe, so uh, if the universe is positively curved, then, uh, sorry, if the, right, if the universe is positively curved, this comes in, and uh, if the universe is negatively curved, the first peak goes out to higher L. And the baryon density is encoded in the ratio between the first peak and the second peak. Okay, the other important data set was the mapping of the universe, and the mapping of the universe um, is hard, but displaying it is harder. So uh, the, this is a wedge of the universe. We're sitting here. Galaxies are put up here uh, with their redshift, and using the Hubble law, their redshift is related to the distance. 
And then this is a wedge of the sky. I believe it's about six degrees wedge of the sky. And uh, what else do we see here? So this is the plane of our own galaxy called the zone of avoidance, where you just don't get a good glimpse of the universe. And I think this is about 100,000 galaxies, or maybe it's only 60,000 galaxies. And just the density of the points gets very, very high. The other issue that comes into play here is that this was uh, not the final Sloan data set. So it looks like uh, the north part of the universe is more dense than the south part. That's not true. And it also looks like the universe thins out with distance. And these surveys are so-called flux limited. So as you go to farther and farther distances, so you detect everything above a certain flux level. And that means that as you go to farther and farther distances, you can only see the brightest objects. And so uh, there's fewer and fewer objects that you can see, so the universe thins out. But what you can see is that uh, it's more of the same. So there are voids, there are walls, and the pattern repeats itself to a large-scale homogeneity. Okay, so putting this all together, um, this is the consensus cosmology. It describes the universe from a time of quark soup to nuclei to atoms to the uh, evolution of galaxies and large-scale structure under the influence of gravity. Um, The universe, the shape of the universe has been determined to be uncurved or flat. It's accelerating. Um, We've mapped out that the universe has atoms, uh, something that acts like matter but uh, has uh, uh, a density higher than that of atoms and dark energy. And here's a set of uh, cosmological parameters that comes from uh, combining WMAP uh, with uh, the supernova measurements of the acceleration of the universe and with large-scale structure. So uh, the omega parameter, I'll come back to that in a minute, omega equals 1 is a flat universe, omega greater than 1 is a universe that curves back on itself. The omega parameter has been determined to about a half a percent and we live in an uncurved or flat universe. The total matter density is 27.3%, plus or minus 1.4%, so that's all matter. The baryon density is 4.6%, with an error bar of about two-tenths of a percent. And um, in the good old days, when I first became a cosmologist, if we determined the matter density to be that and the baryon density to be that, we would jump up and down and say, look how well those numbers agree. And, uh, but they don't, and this will be the start of tomorrow's lecture. This is a 20 sigma discrepancy. There's more matter than the baryons can account for. Uh, dark energy, that will be the third lecture. That's this weird stuff that's smoothly distributed, that has repulsive gravity, and it's 73% plus or minus 1.5%. If you combine uh, all of the data that I was just talking about and ask, what does it say about the Hubble constant? So this is not a direct measurement. This is an indirect measurement. It's 70.4 plus or minus 1.3. Uh, which is consistent with the direct measurement. The age of the universe, oops, yet another mistake here. I forgot to update it. I showed this slide two weeks ago, and so I need to add two weeks to this date. Uh, That was a joke. 13.75 plus or minus 0.11 giga years. And then here's here's a fun number. Um, No one is going to fall out of their seats and say, oh my god, uh, what an accurate measurement of the number of neutrino species. But um, Also encoded uh, in in that uh, CMB physics is the number of neutrino species, and cosmologists now measure that using the microwave background to be 4.34 plus or minus 0.9. And with with uh, W sorry with Planck that error is going to go down uh, by about a factor of 10, Um, because the neutrinos are part of that complex physics that uh, influences. um, things, I- influences those, bump, those acoustic oscillations. So uh, looking at uh, this funny little diagram where the picture doesn't fit the frame, um, so uh, as we pat ourselves on the back and say how well we've done, we've done really well in this census of the universe by allowing ourselves to invent names for 96% of the universe, calling it dark matter and dark energy. So the, the matter that we know actually exists 
from, from being able to study it in the laboratory as the baryons, that's only about 4.5%, and the rest uh, we just invent names for. Uh, all of this, this consensus cosmology is consistent with all of the data, laboratory and cosmological, so f- this would be an example of being consistent with laboratory data. We didn't get 10. We, we got something that was close to uh, 3. And uh, I should have put up here, uh, if you take the, uh, the chi-squared for, th- for this fitting, um, I think the chi-squared was something like 1,200 for 1,100 degrees of freedom. Um, it's a chi-squared that you get about 10% of the time. Um, I thought I would dwell here on our poster child, my poster child for precision cosmology, so th- these are the abundances predicted from Big Bang nucleosynthesis as a function of the baryon to photon ratio. So I said this is this small number that Hitoshi will talk about, that we only have a few baryons uh, per f- photon. So it's a number like a, uh, 6 times 10 to the minus 10. Here it is uh, given in units of omega b h squared. So omega b is fraction of critical density. and um, a, little h is the Hubble constant uh, over 100 kilometers per second. So the Hubble constant comes into play in turning this into a physical density. Uh, deuterium depends very strongly upon the density of baryons. And one of the measurements that was made by the Keck telescope was a measurement of the primordial deuterium. And that allows you to infer omega bh squared to be 0.0213 plus or minus this error bar. The microwave background measures precisely the same thing, omega bh squared, and the microwave background got 0.0225 with the error bar that you see. And I think what is stunning is I doubt you could have found anyone to take a bet before these measurements were made that they would be within 5% of one another. People might have said, sure, they'll be pretty close. These two numbers agree to about a little uh, better than two sigma, uh, or absolutely 5% agreement, and say that the baryon density is about four and a half. If you think about this, this number is based upon nuclear physics when the universe was one second old. This number is based upon these acoustic oscillations I was talking about when the universe is 400,000 years old. It's amazing that those two numbers agree, and that says that the whole framework of general relativity, nuclear physics, where, uh, or the laws of physics don't change with time and don't change with place, uh, all of those things are assumptions that go into, play, go into place here. Um, right. So uh, another uh, a great success of this model that I won't have enough time to talk about is uh, Here is the uh, distribution of matter revealed by the microwave background. So these density perturbations at the level of about 10 to the minus 5. Uh, You amplify them for 13 billion years uh, uh, through gravity, and we can simulate that on a computer. And then uh, you light up those galaxies, and you get a copy or you get a simulation of the universe today. And then you can compare that simulation to the universe that we see and they look the same. They agree. Um, Here's a quantitative comparison. Uh, These are measures of the density fluctuations, uh, delta rho over rho, on the largest scales. uh, Let's see, the galaxy scales are uh, the smallest scales, and then cluster scales, and then scales only measured by the microwave background. So the red points are the microwave background. The black, uh, the green points are... uh, from uh, uh, the redshift surveys like the Sloan, and one curve fits it all. Okay, successes uh, of this consensus cosmology. It's consistent with a large body of high quality uh, lab and cosmological data, detailed history from quarks to us, and a handful of input data. I thought I would maybe express it, compare it to the standard model of particle physics. You get all of this for, and the standard model of particle physics has the same problem. Um, You can say it's 13 parameters or 19 parameters, but something like 10 parameters, depending on how specific you want to be. Of order 10 parameters gives you all of that. 
And of course, there are mysteries, just like there are mysteries in particle physics, and the mysteries will, will dominate uh, the rest of my lectures. Dark matter, that will be the next lecture. Dark energy, uh, inflation, then we have Hitoshi coming to talk about baryogenesis, and maybe I'll uh, put some of these speculations about before the Big Bang in there. And if I have a couple more minutes, do I have a couple more minutes? Okay, good. Um, yeah, that's an advertisement for the dark matter. It's kind of a small advertisement. You know, it's like Google uh, didn't pay very much, so it's just a small... Um, let's see. So let me just tell you a little bit about the specifics of this model. These are units that you're very familiar with. And in the universe, uh, the megaparsec, or uh, about 3 million light years, that's 10 to the 38 GeV to the minus 1, just to calibrate your thinking. That's the typical separation of galaxies. We talked about the Hubble constant for years. We didn't have a very good value for it, so we have this little h, which is the Hubble constant in units of 100. We now know that that little h is about 0.7, and here's a handy-dandy fact. Little h squared is, to several significant figures, a half. Um, the Hubble law that uh, you multiply uh, the redshift times the Hubble constant to the minus 1, that gives you the distance. And uh, here's that formula. Uh, galaxies, uh, a typical galaxy, there's a distribution of, of galaxy luminosities. Uh, these are uh, un, uh, uh, faint galaxies. This is our galaxy, sort of the so-called L-star galaxy. And then there are not very many bright galaxies. There's lots of faint galaxies. Uh, our galaxy, or Andromeda, has a luminosity of about 10 to the 11 suns. Uh, and a mass of about 10 to the 12 solar masses. Uh, but galaxies go down six orders of magnitude below that and only a few order ma of mag magnitudes above that. Okay, let me quickly take you on a tour of the universe uh, and then uh, we'll end. So 10 to the 11 galaxies across the sky. Um, the density of galaxies is about 0 0.001 per megaparsec cube, so the separation is closer to 3 or 4 uh, megaparsecs. Uh, the typical mass, 10 to the 12, uh, and I gave you the range before, the mass of galaxies goes from a million to 10 to the 13 solar masses. Uh, they're really pretty to look at. And so uh, nice spirals that when we are talking to a safe audience, so no creation scientists. We call these grand design spirals. But we have to be very careful. Uh, uh, and then uh, there are elliptical galaxies and barred spiral galaxies. And what's kind of fun is Hubble was the first one to study this. And he put this in a tuning fork. And he started with the ellipticals. And then he had uh, the ellipticals evolving into spirals uh, of of this type and the barred type. And so the evolution went that way, from left to right. The evolution is not so simple, but what we now understand is the evolution actually goes that way, from right to left. Uh, clusters of galaxies, these are the largest gravitationally bound systems. Um, this is the Coma Cluster, which we'll visit tomorrow. This is where Zwicky discovered uh, dark matter. So these are bound structures of several, hundred, uh, several thousand galaxies. Uh, the masses range from 10 to the 13 to 10 to the 16 solar masses. Uh, Coma has about 3,000 uh, galaxies, 10 to the 15 solar mass. Um, this is what this is what a cluster of galaxies looks like with X-ray eyes. And basically, all you can see is uh, diffuse X-ray emission from the hot inner cluster gas. So they look very different. Uh, and in fact, that's where most of the baryons are. Oops, there was a number I wanted to tell you. 5% of galaxies are found in rich clusters. So only 5% are found in rich clusters. Most galaxies aren't in rich clusters. Um, We'll come back to that fact. Uh, oh, this is pretty bad. Uh, this was uh, isotropy, same in all directions. So this is the Hubble Deep Field uh, north and the Hubble Deep Field south. Do they look the same? Uh, the microwave background is our best evidence, but of course it's the universe at 400,000 years. Um, this is probably the best evidence that we have that the universe is homogeneous today. Um, 
And this is a wedge of the universe using a certain kind of uh, uh, galaxies called uh, luminous red galaxies or bright red galaxies. And so here are the galaxies you saw before. Um, and these bright red galaxies provide a volume-limited sample out to about a gigaparsec. And what you're supposed to see is, and I think you do see, is actually uh, homogeneity. And let's see, I think this will probably be, I hear growling stomachs, and I have a few more slides, but I think I'll save these for the beginning of next time. Thank you. Oh, and I guess I'm um, responsible for taking questions, and I should have said that you could have stopped me at any point, like, for example, if the PowerPoint was off and I was just talking in space. But are there any... uh, And next time, please interrupt me. Are there any questions before we... Yeah. Oh, how well do we know that they're 10 to the 11? So uh, that's an interesting question. So we know the number of galaxies by doing very... The Sloan doesn't go very deep. So the Sloan only goes to redshift of about uh, 0.1. And we know that there's 10 to the 11 galaxies by doing very deep samples of the universe, like the Hubble Deep Field, and assuming that that part on the sky is typical that uh, it doesn't look dramatically different from another part on the sky. And so there is an assumption there, but I think I went through some of the evidence for, for isotropy. But the, just to finish, your thought, or to finish your thought there, what's sort of stunning is the Sloan survey got 200 million galaxies within a factor of 1,000. Um, within, within 10 or 20 years, we will have surveys that have all 10 to the eleven. At least positions, not maybe probably not redshifts, but but positions. The Sloan got a million redshifts, so we're essentially, you know, that that's that's easy. Getting all ten to the eleven positions is relatively easy, and uh, you know, if if people thought it was really important, it could be done, you know, within five years. But within ten or twenty years, that will just be done. We'll have a catalog of all the galaxies. Was that the question you were asking? Good. Yes. Um, let's see. So, so number one, um, I'm going to break you like I break my students. Uh, and so the, in the universe, what really counts is density. And what we can really do well is density. And so when you ask how much mass is there in the universe, you know, all kinds of things start to jiggle. Uh, because we don't know how big the universe is. So then you can say, well, how much mass is there within the observable universe? And um, so within the observable universe, let's, let's quickly do the numbers here. So about 10 to the 11 galaxies. Each galaxy is 10 to the 11 stars. So now we're up to 10 to the 22. Each star is about 10 to the 33 grams. Uh, so we're now up to 10 to the 56, but I think we missed about a factor of 10. I look on the floor here, and I spilled a little bit. I'm a sloppy guy. So 10 to the 57 baryons within the observable universe, and then a baryon is 10 to the minus uh, 23 grams, I think. Isn't that right? Does anybody here measure baryons in grams? Uh, So 10 10 to the 57 times 10 to the minus 23 is 10 to the 34... Uh. Oh, baryons. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Well, that was... The, see, I was raised in the old style, you know, in cosmology where the sign and the exponent really didn't matter. That was supposed to be plus 10... To, so I guess that's 10 to the 80 baryons. Um, you, you may have heard someone standing up here make, making a mistake earlier, but that was... Uh, uh, that was Albert was coaching me, and so when I... So 10 to the 80 baryons. One last question. Yes? We sometimes hear the problem with the CMB at large scales. 
Um, so that's a really fun, um, that's a really fun one. Uh, the question had to do with the CMB at really large scales. And so um, let me orient you here. Um, we measure multiple amplitudes on the sky. That's what we measure. What theory predicts is the variance of the distribution from which they're drawn. So we now take the measured multiple amplitude and try to uh, calculate the variance of the parent sample, of the sample from which they were drawn. And so when you go to high multiples, let's go to multiple of 1,000. So then you have 2,001 multiples. And when you try to make an estimate of the, of the variance, you can do it to about 1% to the square root of the, or no, whatever the square root of 1,000 is, a few percent. Um, when you go to the low multiples, like L equals 3, 4, 5, you've got 5, 6, 7 uh, multiples. And when you make an estimate of the variance of the underlying sample, it's big. And um, if I thought I could quickly, uh, let me see if I can, if I go out of this, see if I go out of this and, oops, hit escape. Oh, I see, I turned this off. Uh, let me just show you, show you that data because this has been uh, one of those uh, interesting from the beginning. Ah, what do I want? I want all the slides. Let's go see all the slides. Nope, that's not what I... There we go. Uh, it's one of these. It's, oops. That's the baby we want. I've got a slideshow. There we go. Okay, so this is what you're talking about. Um, and let's see, does this... Um, I guess that's L equals 2 or 3. I think this does not show all the multiples, but th this one is good enough. L equals 2 and L equals 3. So this is the theory curve that predicts the variance of the sample that they're drawn from. This is the estimate of the uh, parent distribution. And uh, you can see that this is low. So that's what you were talking about. And you can now ask... Uh, and both the, oct both the quadrupole and octopole, I think they're not both shown on this plot, but both L equals 2 and L equals 3 are low. And so then you can start asking questions like, what is the probability that if you were drawing multiples from this sample, you would get uh, a set of L equals 2 and L equals 3 multiples on the sky that would give you this low a variance? And the answer is, depending on how you ask the question, 5%, 10%, 15%. And so now what do you do with that? And, th well, theorists write a lot of papers is what you do because uh, you can now, you, you now have this dilemma that they're low, um, but you didn't have a theory, an a priori theory that said you're going to get low multiples out there. And, of course, after they're found to be low, theorists are extremely clever and they can give you 10 to the 9 theories that would, would explain it. And what's even worse than that is, so as an experimentalist, what you want to do is, okay, how can, I, how can I make that error bar go smaller? So, well, actually CERN, I think, has an experiment that's trying to do that. Aren't you trying to create a new universe or is it just destroy this one? So you have to create... <laughs> um, so you need another sky. And one way to get another sky is to wait for 10 billion years. Another way to get another sky is to move through our universe. But basically, this, this error bar is controlled by what we call sample variants. Those are the only five oct uh, you know, quadrupoles and only five. And so we're stuck. So then theorists can say, well, let me see how the octopole and the quadrupole is aligned, and is there an axis of evil, and so on and so forth. And so, um, to me, uh, in the absence of a good theory that not only says you should find low multiples and they should be aligned, and says, by the way, go do this other experiment, and I'm making a definite prediction for that other experiment, and if I don't agree, you can throw my theory away. 
there's not much to do. And so it's, yeah. Well, the, no, no, no. So, so the quadrupole comes from the underlying density perturbations. It's the same as all the other multipoles. So it's only the dipole that's special, where you can generate a dipole. Actually, you can also generate a kinematic quadrupole. By moving through space, you can generate a quadrupole. But it's, it's very, very small. I shouldn't have said that. I, so all of the rest come from the density perturbations. And so the question is, do you believe, I mean, this is, uh, you know, I guess they bin the octopole and the quadrupole together. They're a little bit low. So was that just the luck of the dice, or is there some further information there? And right now, I would say the best interpretation is that's the luck of the dice, although that's one of those nagging little facts that you file away. And of course, history, I remember that there was this problem with the atmospheric neutrinos, that there weren't enough of them. Eh, it can't be big mixing. Eh, just and that fact got filed away and eventually became something important. So maybe this is something important, but right now it's ad hoc theories that don't make any other predictions. Uh, but that's the effect and that's the dilemma because you can't do any better except, I see everybody wants to go to lunch, um, you never know when measuring these. The story may not be done on the measurements of these. These low multiples involve, in a very delicate way, how you subtract our own galaxy. And I don't think there's a problem there. Um, but the, octopole, the quadrupole used to be lower in the first WMAP data set and then mysteriously popped up because of their uh, galaxy modeling. And so maybe, maybe there'll be a little more motion there. I think it's probably pretty stable by now. People have looked at that. But... Um, let's go to lunch. <laughs>